Well, good evening and welcome to church on this Thursday evening. It's amazing I remembered what day it was, but uh, Thursday evening, looking forward to service tonight, what the Lord's going to do. Had a good night uh, last night, and uh, from the singing to the preaching to the presentation, every every bit of it was uh, was a blessing, and so I am excited about what the Lord has in store for tonight. And so we're going to start it off this evening by getting our hymn books together. And uh, let's go to hymn 299, hymn 299, rescuing the, Rescue the Perishing. And so why don't you stand with me and let's sing this song as we open up our service this evening. 299, on the first, rescue the perishing, care for the dying, snatch them in pity from sin and the grave, weep ones lift up the fallen tell them of jesus the mighty to save rescue the perishing care for the dying jesus is merciful jesus will save on the second though they are sliding him still he is waiting waiting the penitent child to receive plead with them earnestly plead with them gently he will forgive if they only believe rescue the perishing care for the dying jesus is merciful jesus will save let's sing all four on that third verse down in the human heart crushed by the tempter feelings lie buried that grace can restore touched by a loving heart wakened by kindness cords that are broken will vibrate once more rescue the perishing care for the dying jesus is merciful jesus us will save sounds good so far but let's add a little bit more volume this on this last verse let's sing it out like we mean it's a it's the last time you get to sing sing it like it's the last opportunity you got and let's let the lord know we're happy to be in church this evening on the last rescue the perishing duty demands it strength for your labor the lord will provide narrow way patiently win them tell the poor wanderer a savior has died rescue the perishing care for the dying jesus is merciful jesus will save amen good singing Whew. Catch your breath for a few minutes because we're going to sing again here in just a little bit. But uh, let's go ahead and go to the Lord in a word of prayer. And uh, we'll open up this service in, in the, the right way. And uh, Brother, Brother Sprunger, why don't you open us up, please, sir? Amen. You could be seated. Just a couple of, uh, of things real quick. Of course, as you noticed, many of you already have been over to, to look at them, but um, the boards that we do have up, we've, uh, we've gotten the, um, the sign holder, plastic, yeah, all that stuff is on them. So we got uh, the number of missionaries, a few letters we're missing. We're going to try to locate the latest ones that we've got and get them up there. And a few cards uh, of the people that, uh, that are represented, we got to get a, a card to put up there as well, but we'll eventually get all the little bitty gaps that are, uh, that are there filled, um, but that is, uh, that is what it's going to look like, and uh, as, you, as you already know, you can walk by, you can read about the missionaries, and if you ever wondered who exactly do we support, uh, as, as of this point, the only time that you really know who it all is that we support, if you go to the website, you'll go, you can go to the missionaries, you can see it all there. Um, but other than that, it's our Wednesday night prayer bulletin. They're on the back of that prayer bulletin for praying for them, and that's about it. 
But, uh, but now, um, just coming into the church, the, the good thing is, number one, like I said before, you can tell, uh, we support missionaries. And then uh, anybody coming in can easily walk up, see who it is that we support, and could even read the latest uh, prayer letters that we have uh, concerning the different missionaries. And so I encourage you to, uh, to take the opportunity to go by on a regular basis, see if there's a new letter put out. Uh, Pastor Smith's going to be handling that for us as the letters come in and uh, we go through them and read them ourselves. He'll be taking those brand new letters and replacing the old with the new and trying to keep that up and fresh. And so you have the opportunity to go by and read those at any time and uh, be able to keep up to date with each one of the missionaries that we support. And as we take new ones on, we'll add them to the boards. And so um, we'll just keep on, like we said before last night, we'll keep on Moses. I told my wife, I said, what happens? Because we're, we're pretty much going to fill up that and that to begin with. So I said, you know, we come over here, but what happens once we're over here? We're full over here. We get my dad's church in Ocean Springs. They were too, they were too high, okay, <laughs> stacked too high all the way around the church. Um, I'm like, I don't know where else to go. She said, simple. You just put them right down the middle, right up underneath the lights and everything. You just, you just circle the entire auditorium uh, with the missionaries. I'm like, <clears throat> when in doubt, go to the one who has a better idea. So, um, but uh, <laughs> we. We know where the brains of this operation really lies anyways, but, um, but no, that's, I'm looking forward to that day, looking forward to that day when we're saying, okay, Lord, I don't, I don't see enough wall space anymore. We've got to figure something else out, but um, it is exciting. It's beautiful. Again, thank you, Brother Kenneth, so much, and I uh, know he, he doesn't do it for the recognition, but um, he put, put some hard work into it, and uh, the boards look absolutely awesome. And uh, besides that, uh, just as an announcement, didn't forget, um, there is a sign-up sheet in the foyer. All you people in Bethel, you know how much we love our sign-up sheets. And so there's another one out there. Um, and if you are planning on going to the pancake breakfast, uh, that's this Saturday, isn't it? No, next Saturday. Next Saturday. Pancake breakfast next Saturday. Uh, if you're going to be going to that uh, with the, the, the prime timers and all, you be sure to get out there and uh, put your name on there so we know who all to expect. And um, you plan on taking the shuttle bus, brother? Okay, leave it at 8 o'clock that Saturday. Plan on taking the shuttle bus. And so be sure, if you plan to go, uh, be sure to sign up. Oh, yes. And uh, you have to pay for it, okay? <laughs> so, but um, but they are, it's $5, okay? All, you'll, you will not fail to eat every bit that you possibly could. It, 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 they will fill you up big time. For five bucks, it's well worth it, but um, they get the tickets, uh, but the Schmitz have the tickets over here, so please get one of those, and, and then put your name out there so they know who all is planning on going, and I don't know that there was anything else other than, I will say this, I'll just do a reminder at the very end of the service, but um, the ladies canceled the shopping trip today just because of the rain and the cold. It was, uh, it was not the ideal conditions to try to get out there and go in and out of stores, and so they, they put that off until tomorrow, all right? So the plan is, Lord willing, um, I forgot to say that yesterday, <laughs> but Lord willing, if nothing else weather-wise gets in the way, the plan is tomorrow, same time frame, 1230, 1 o'clock, uh, for the ladies to, to go shopping. And so, again, if you want to be a part of that, you want to go, let my wife know, and uh, you ladies in the church are welcome to go with them uh, as they go into town Tomorrow's not supposed to be any rain from the last time I looked, so it should be a good day for that. Uh, I do want to say again, thank you so much for the, the missionaries we have with us. We've got two more that will be coming in um, tomorrow, Brother Justice Mize and his wife will be in, and then Sunday we'll also add to that Brother Jeff Bellamy and his wife. Of course, right now we've got uh, Brother, Brother Adam Walls, who uh, last night presented his work, and um, just, I just about had a coronary. I mean, he was, he, I think he was hyped up on coffee or something. But, but no, he did an awesome job. I've actually had numerous people talk about uh, the, the presentation. And so it was very good. Um, but Brother Adam and his, uh, I had your name. Oh, my goodness. Ashley, Ashley, I should have said it when I had it because it, you know, I came back to it. It was gone. But um, Brother Adam and, and Miss, uh, Miss Ashley, being with us has been a, a, a pleasure to have y'all with us. I know y'all leaving out in the morning, and so pray for them. Remind me again where you're going. I was going to say that. I didn't want to be wrong, though. Okay, Kansas City. They got a little bit of a drive ahead of them, and so uh, pray the Lord to keep them safe on the road. But Brother Sprunger in just a minute is going to come and um, 
present uh, an update for us, and we'll have a, a video with that. But, of course, we also, for those who may, maybe were not here last night, uh, Brother Jeff Farnham. And um, well, I say Farnham, but it's Farnham. I don't know how you say Farnham. You say it Farnham, right? Okay, that's what I thought. But um, the, uh, the, Brother Jeff and, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Catherine. Catherine. I'm telling you, it's a pulpit. It's the pulpit. But because uh, I have all this sitting over there, and then we get up here, and phew, there it goes. But um, but uh, brother Jeff and Miss Catherine being with us, it's been an honor to have them with us. And last night again was wonderful. Looking forward to what the Lord has placed on His heart and mind for this evening, and uh, we're looking forward to the remainder of the conference. But I'm gonna go ahead. We're gonna move forward, and we're gonna let brother Sprunger come, and um, and he's going to give us an update about their ministry, and then uh, when he's done. Um, Speaking here, we'll also watch a, a short video about the, the ministry as well, and then we'll move forward with the service. Thank you, Pastor. God bless you. David in Psalm 105 records these two verses, and I want you to just mark them. It says, Oh, give thanks unto the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing unto him, sing psalms unto him, Talk ye of all his wondrous works. Folks, you and I have a lot to share about what God is doing. I like to tell folks that really, Joy and I have been blessed to be missionaries out in the West Indies. And don't get shocked, we don't do much, God does it. He just gives us the privilege of experiencing it. And I often say that we're just, we're just journalists for the Lord. And we report on what God's doing. And you know, the truth about it is we're not reporting fake news either. We're reporting the real thing. And it's so exciting because we have the privilege of talking about God's wondrous works. One of the most wonderful things that God's done in my life is the day I got saved. I was 10 years old. I was in a union meeting in my hometown of Burn, Indiana, and back in those days, they would come together once a year, and they would invite a very special speaker to come in, and we would have a week of meetings, and that year, they invited Dr. Lehman Strauss to come and preach. I remember I was in the choir loft, and we had a huge choir loft it was in the First Mennonite Church, a huge auditorium, and I was smack dab in the middle. And Dr. Lehman Strauss preached on hell that night, and he gave an invitation, but I couldn't move. We were packed in like, like tuna, uh, sardines in a tuna can, you know. And I went home that night under conviction. I climbed the stairs, and I remember climbing that stairs and my heart was heavy, and I, bow, I bowed down my head and knelt beside the bed that night, and I opened up my heart's door and said, Lord Jesus, I know I'm a sinner. I want you to come in and be my Savior. And I thank God that simple prayer brought the Lord Jesus Christ into my heart and my life. And little did I ever anticipate what God would do with my life. Well... In high school, I, I had surrendered to the Lord, and I, I said, Lord, I'll go anywhere. I'll do anything you want me to do, but Lord, don't ever send me to Africa. I don't know why I didn't want to go to Africa. I guess it's just because I heard how far it was away from home, and I didn't want to go that far. But, you know, the Lord heard my prayer, and he honored my prayer as he has a plan for each of us. And if he didn't want me to go to Africa, he was going to send me there anyhow. So I guess he just honored my prayer because I was praying according to his will. Well, anyhow, while I was in high school, I went forward in a meeting and I said, Lord, I'll go. Well, I didn't know what God would have me to do. I thought, well, maybe the Lord would have me be a youth pastor. I love young people. And so I was pretty good at mathematics. And I said, well, Lord, you know, to work with young people, they didn't pay youth pastors in that day. You had to just 
have a, an income and you serve the Lord in your local church. And that was fine with me. And so I headed off to Bob Jones University with a math major, thinking I would go into youth ministries and be able to teach at a school and make contact with young people. My third year there, I had a very serious automobile accident. And I had a, a, a concussion. For two weeks, I didn't know where my classes were. I was glad that I had written them down in my notebook. And all I did was follow my schedule. But when you're in a calculus class, you can't afford not to remember what the teacher taught you for, for two weeks. So when the grades came out, I had a perfect flag. It was F, 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 F. Well, I couldn't function, but I stayed around. I'm not a quitter. My, uh, my parents taught me that no matter what you start, don't, don't quit until it's finished. Well, God had a plan because in that calculus class, I met my wife. Thank the Lord for my dear wife. She's smart. She made it through Bob Jones in mathematics, and she got interested in me. Well, we got married in 1970, and God opened the door for me to go to Tennessee Temple and while I was at Tennessee Temple, God moved upon my heart in a missions conference. As I sat in this conference wondering, Lord, what would you have me to do? Dr. Tom Freedy interjected in the middle of the message, just stopped cold. And he said, I want you all to pray that God would call a young man who would go to the West Indies and be a missionary pilot, church planter, who would help us to propagate the gospel down there. And I'll be honest with you, as I sat there, it was as if God just took his finger and touched my heart and said, you're the one. And I began to argue with the Lord. I said, Lord, I'm not that smart. Nobody knows me. I didn't come from a famous church. I don't have any rich uncles to pay for an airplane. And you know what? God confirmed in my heart he was calling me. Later that evening, I went to talk to Dr. Tom Freeney, and I told him how God had really impressed his will on my heart that night. And I was excited that I could share that with him because I thought he'd be excited too. He looked at me and he said, young man, if you didn't get over it in about 30 days, come see me. Well, it kind of popped the balloon in my heart. But you know what? You can't get away from what God's telling you to do. Nobody else may be excited about it, but I'll tell you one thing. If you know what God wants you to do, you'll stay excited about it. I went home that night, and I told my wife, I said, Honey, God called me tonight. We're going to the West Indies. I'm going to be a missionary pilot and a church planner down there. And she looked at me, and, you know, she's pretty smart. She knows numbers. She said, Where are you going to get the money for an airplane? I said, Honey, that's not my problem. That's God's problem. I figured, why should I be worried about what God has a problem for? I can't answer that, but God can. If I told you how God worked it all out, we'd be here all night. But let me tell you, we ended up in the West Indies, 1975, flying a Piper Aztec, beautiful six-passenger airplane loaded well with avionics. We began working all through the islands. God gave us a ministry second to none down there. We had the privilege of helping to start churches, to facilitate the needs of missionaries, to encourage young national students at Blue Water Bible College to go out into the West Indies. I had the privilege of assisting them. I had the privilege of taking evangelists all over the islands and being with them in evangelistic campaigns. I'll tell you, God was good. Then the Lord burdened my heart that we needed to get a better, bigger airplane because what we were flying was full all the time, and I, were having, I was having to make two trips a lot of times, and God provided us a Beechcraft Queen Air. We really had no idea what was taking place, but God provided something because what was going to transpire after that needed a bigger airplane. I remember how that... One night I received a call from the island of Dominica from Johnny Daniels, who you support. And Johnny and Jim Drew were there, and 
He said, Brother Sprunger, we have a coup taking place. We want to be with our church tomorrow on Sunday, but how soon can you be in, in here Monday morning? We're afraid that the telephone lines are going to be snipped yet tonight, and we won't be able to communicate you. I said, I'll be there at 6 o'clock sharp, be at the airport. He said, well, we're sending the family out, but Jim Drew and myself are going to stay. Well, with that in mind, I had the airplane all loaded with fuel. I headed out at 4 o'clock in the morning in the dark of the night and went down to the island of Dominica to land at 6 o'clock in the morning. I noticed there was some strange activity around the airport. Johnny Daniels, Jim Drew, and the family came running out on the tarmac and I didn't even shut the engines down. I dropped down the air stair door. They came flying in with 11 suitcases and one guitar. There were 10 of them, and I made the 11th on an eight-passenger airplane. I told Jim Drew, I said, why don't you leave your guitar behind? He said, no, sir. He said, that goes with me. I'll leave my wife. But anyhow, I said, I better keep them all together. We had 11 of us on that airplane, and God provided a, a bigger airplane. It was a very dangerous flight because we were grossly overloaded by over 1,000 pounds. We made it back to Puerto Rico, and God used that to be the catalyst that ultimately opened Johnny Daniel's eyes to a need in Puerto Rico. Well, we began talking about what was transpiring throughout the islands, and we knew that there was a great movement of liberation theology and already some of the islands were beginning to break apart and they were beginning to implement socialism and communism. It was just a year or so later, I went into the island of Grenada in order to bring a family out and upon landing in Grenada, I was greeted on the tarmac by 15 Grenadian soldiers Loaded with, with AK-47s, loaded, locked, and pointed at me. The Cuban government had just spearheaded a coup. The president of, of Grenada had been killed. Maury Bishop had taken the prime minister's position, and Grenada was under lock. I had a load of instruments for the Christian school, and I was bringing the family out, and I stood there as those young Grenadian boys pointed those weapons at me, and I thought in my heart, how much longer are we going to have in the islands to reach the islands with the gospel? I left two days later with that family. I was followed all the time by one of the agents of the Grenadian government. Upon leaving, I really wondered when my next trip back there would be. Upon getting back to Puerto Rico, Johnny Daniels, Jim Drew, and I sat down, and we began to discuss the situation in the islands, and we realized that maybe at the most we'd have five years left. We began to pray, and God gave us a contact with, with a man that you may know. His name was Randy Pike. He had worked in South Africa and had written 11 tracks, some of the most powerful tracks I've ever read in presenting the truth from a biblical perspective of the falsity and the fallacy of liberation theology. Randy Pike gave us permission to print those tracks, and so we pooled our money together, Johnny Daniels, Jim Drew, and myself, I remember we all coughed up $1,000 a piece for the paper, the ink, and the transportation of two pallets of tracks down to Puerto Rico. I opened my big mouth, which I often do, and I told them, I'll see to it those tracks get out into the islands. They arrived, and we unloaded them in our carport, and I began to read those tracks, and I began to feel a little bit afraid about what I had just taken on as my responsibility. I realized that having those tracks in your hand could easily have put me into incarceration or even into a very dangerous position. 
I was praying, asking the Lord, Lord, how in the world can I get a million tracks into these islands that are, are closing the door to missionaries without coming into conflict? I had to do something clandestinely. You know, one of the things about those kind of events, God always gives you an answer. It's amazing how God answers prayer. Well, one night, I got the idea, you know, the best way to do this is get some 55-gallon oil drums, those that had the lid cut out, and I'll just fill those things up with tracks and put about a foot worth of food on top. Then when I go into the islands, I'll tell those uh, immigration officers and customs officers I have barrels with food in them. And before I left, with the plane loaded with barrels of tracks and a little bit of food, I would buy beautiful, red, delicious apples. We could get them in Puerto Rico. So I'd take them out, and every time I landed, I'd go into the customs office, and I'd say, how many of you guys would like to have a red, delicious apple? You know what was amazing? Everywhere I went, they all wanted my apples. Well, I threw them out. Then I'd say, how many of you guys want to come inspect my barrels that I have some food in? Not a one time did they get out of their seat. They were crunching too hard on those apples. And they say, oh, go ahead, preacher. You go ahead, get your barrels for the missionaries. We were able to get one million tracts distributed in all those islands out there without one time being inspected. That's the hand of God. I had one person in one church uh, looked at me and he said, Preacher, that's bribery. I said, well, you know, there's, I don't know, there's a very thin line between bribery and tipping. The only thing I know that's different is timing. <laughs> so I called it my tip, all right? Well, God used that. It opened up in f less than five years. All the islands were opened up again. And missionaries are in every one of those islands where we drop those tracks. And now the rest of the story, because Joy and I were privileged to be on the island of Grenada where Joseph and Donna Childers are serving the Lord. Joseph told me when he went to Grenada, he said, Brother Sprunger, God's laid a town on my heart that he wants me to go and to start a church. And that church was in Granville, one kilometer from Pearl's Airport, where I was accosted by those Grenadian soldiers that day. And today that church is growing. Souls are being saved. He has five in his Bible Institute now, and he's training young men for the ministry. And I praise God. God's still on his throne. He may give us some challenging moments, but let me tell you, it's a thrill to serve the Lord. Well, it was 11 years ago, Dr. Pat Creed asked me if I'd come on board to be assistant director and work with him in the islands. We had had such a wonderful time out there. We had had the opportunity of assisting missionaries and helping to establish about eight different churches. We had the privilege of working with nationals. But I'll tell you one thing, it's just wonderful being able to just do what God calls you to do. And today we're serving 60 missionaries, national pastors, and I just want to share a little bit more about the special blessings that we're involved in. Four years ago, I received a call from Jeremy Benbrook, who was in, in the island of Togo, or in the country of Togo, and he said, Brother Sprunger, God's been working on my heart. He said, Natalie and I, I think that God's going to lead us out of Togo one of these days. And he's been putting the island of Martinique on our hearts. He said, what do you know about Martinique? I said, well, I know one thing. There hasn't been an American missionary, fundamental Baptist missionary there for over 45 years. Matter of fact, it's 45 years. And I know it's hard to get into the French islands, but I said, we're still serving a great God. Let's pray about it. A year and a half ago, Jeremy came out of Togo, and 
he went down to Martinique and he met one of the older national pastors, sat down with that older missionary, or that older national pastor, and that pastor said, Jeremy, we haven't had an American missionary in here over 40 years. We have lost our pioneer spirit. We need somebody young, vivacious, who will bring the gospel to our young people again. He said, I'll do everything in my power to get you into Martinique. Come on. Jeremy and Natalie are there, and they're looking for a piece of property that they can start or a place that they can rent on the south side of Martinique, and they're starting a church right now. And they got all of the paperwork, and they got a warm welcome from the French government. That's God working. I spoke to Luis Cuadrado this last week. He's in the, in the, uh, in the, uh, on the west end of Puerto Rico in the area of Mayaguez where Joy and I served. I was co-pastor at Iglesia Bautista Nueva Vida. Luis Cuadrado is a pastor. They lost his wife last year to cancer, and he's going on, and he said, Brother Sprunger, I'm so excited. He said, we've seen souls saved, and last week we had several who got baptized. My, I'll tell you what, I was so excited to, to the fact that the works that we've been in are going on for the glory of God. Well, in closing, we put some of these booklets, Romans, out on the table. If you have a Hispanic friend, I'd suggest you take one and give it to we just printed 750,000 of these and sent them into the Dominican Republic, along with over 1 million tracts. When they arrived in the in, in Dominican Republic, the forwarder went out there and took some of the boxes off of our container and put some contraband in our container, and our container was locked down on the wharf, and they began charging me $130 a day for it sitting there. Well, I wasn't going to pay the taxes on it. I wasn't going to pay the wharfage when it should be totally exonerated. Well, the bill began to climb up to over $55,000, and we were praying, God, give us the right contacts that you can deal with this. I was in one church, and I said, folks, I'm going to ask you to pray that God would sell cattle off of his, off of his mountains so I could pay a bill. One guy raised his hand and said, Brother Sprunger, what kind of cattle you want him to sell? I said, Angus, they normally bring more money at the auction block. But anyhow, you know, God doesn't have to sell his cattle. He just deals with the, the, the heart of the king. We were able to get to the key right-hand man of President Medina of the Dominican Republic. He's a Christian man. And he went to President Medina and he said, President, I want to share a problem we have this group of independent Baptists have a container with gospel literature on it, and they have two, uh, two big pallets of tracts, and they have them impounded, and they owe over $55,000. President Medina sent a memo down to the dock and to the Department of Hacienda, and he exonerated all of our fees and released our container in two days, and we didn't have to pay a dime. You know, we're serving a great God. Well, I'll tell you, it is exciting to just be in a church that loves missionaries. And I want to thank you for your faithful support. And I want to thank you for your prayer support because God's doing some marvelous things all over the Caribbean. But we need help. We have a number of missionaries that are now coming off the field because of their health. Don and Bridget Dryden, I've been in touch with them. Even this morning, I spoke to Don. And he said, Brother Sprunger, I can't hardly walk anymore. This disease I have is affecting my muscles. They'll be coming home in March. You be praying for them. But we need replacements. He said, Brother Sprunger, would you pray that God would send somebody to help Benji? Just help take care of all the equipment and help us build and help us to provide the, the things we need for this ministry. I said, Don, I'm praying that God would give us a couple for Haiti. 
I need a couple in Antigua. I need more couples to go out into the Lesser Antilles, into islands that need a good fundamental independent Baptist work. Pray with us for more laborers. And I hope that when you see this video, it will just stir your heart to pray more for us in the West Indies. Isaiah 42, 12. Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare his praise in the islands. In the 1400s, exploration of new territory captured the minds and hearts of many a courageous explorer. By late 1400, Christopher Columbus was credited with the founding of the area called the West Indies in the New World. As these became developed, the need for additional laborers on the sugarcane plantations paved the way for slave trade. Slave ships would bring Africans from West Africa, and then sugar, molasses, and rum were sent to America. The third leg of the trip to Europe would be loaded with American rum, molasses, and tobacco. For over 300 years, the slave trade existed. Thousands of Africans and East Indians were brought over into the West Indies. Today, it is estimated that African descendants make up 80% of the 45 million people living in the West Indies. East Indians, Europeans, and Chinese make up the remaining group. With the desire to capture land, a number of countries began exploring the West Indies. As they planted their individual flags, they also left their languages in their claimed island. Today, Spanish, French, English, Dutch, Creole, and Papiamento can be heard in the islands. Because of the variety of cultural backgrounds, the West Indies are very diverse. There are areas still controlled by native Indian descendants. Each island has a unique culture based upon its history. As the world evolves technologically, so has the Caribbean. There exists third world cultures and modern up-to-date metropolitan areas. Cell phones can be found everywhere. Transportation is available and many own their own cars or motorcycles. Modern day supermarkets are available, but many still find the joy of shopping at the local street markets. In many of the islands, you will find franchises like Kentucky Fried Chicken, Pizza Hut, and even McDonald's. Today, there exists a great need to reach the young people. Around 30% of the population are young people under 15 years of age. The harvest fields are white unto harvest. Laborers are needed to reach the youth of today. 30 years ago, there was a wave of missionaries who went around the world to reach their generation. Today, we need another wave of dedicated missionaries to carry the gospel to their generation. Although they are more techy and knowledgeable about world affairs, they still have a void in their heart without the Lord Jesus Christ. West Indians are very religious. One will find Catholics, Hindus, Muslims, Spiritists, Protestants, and Rastafarians. Although they are very religious, few really know the truth about biblical salvation. Many are searching a peace of heart. The Rastafarians smoke marijuana thinking that they are inhaling the Holy Spirit. Hindus erect colored flags representing their spiritual condition, thinking that by doing so, they will find eternal peace. The Spiritists sacrifice animals, hoping to find spiritual contentment. But without Jesus Christ, there is no real hope. Doors are open throughout the Caribbean. Many towns need a good gospel preaching church. In many areas, missionaries are able to teach the word of God in public schools. Door-to-door -door evangelism, vacation Bible school, and sports events are readily used to get the gospel out. As the Macedonia call was heard by Paul, would you listen and respond to the call of, Come over, 
and help us. The Caribbean needs you to reach your generation for Christ. Many of our current missionaries are facing retirement because of their physical conditions. Would you be the one who would stand in the gap and be Christ's representative in that island? For more information, please contact us at bimmy.org. You need someone like you to answer that call. You are watching this video. We appeal to you to come over, answer the Macedonian call, and come and be a part of it. Isaiah 42, 12. Let them give glory unto the Lord and declare his praise in the islands. Amen. Well, that was good. A wonderful update. Lots of, lots of things going on. Lots of stuff happening. And I uh, appreciate that. Thank you, Brother Sprunger. And the challenge, honestly, every, every, every single person in this auditorium should be praying, asking the Lord, what do I do? And uh, some, some of us aren't as young as we used to be. I'm not talking about me, okay? But uh, it doesn't mean that God doesn't still have a plan and still want to use each and every person in here in some way, somewhere. And it might just be right here at home in what we can do, or it could be the uh, Lord would call someone from here to go around the world. I don't know, but uh, he does. We just have to be tender to and listening for that call. Well, why don't you take your hymn books one more time? Why don't you stand with me, stretch your legs for one more second, and uh, we'll receive the offering at the end of, of this psalm. But let's go to uh, hymn 294. Hymn 294, Set My Soul Afire, Lord. Let's sing a couple of verses of this, and then the ushers will come and receive our offering, and we'll get ready for the preaching here shortly. Hymn 294 on the first. Set my soul afire, Lord, for thy holy Burn it deep within me, let your voice be heard. Millions grope in darkness in this day and hour. I will be a witness, fill me with thy power. Set my soul afire. Set my soul afire, make my life a witness of thy saving power. Millions grope in darkness, waiting for thy word. Set my soul afire, Lord, set my soul fire on that last verse set my soul afire lord in my daily life far too long i've wandered in this day of strife nothing else will matter but to live for thee i will lives in me. Set my soul afire, Lord. Set my soul afire. Make my life a witness of thy saving power. Millions grope in darkness, waiting Offering received in the missions conference will go to uh, help for the needs of the missions conference. And so I ask you to, to give as the Lord has laid on your heart to give during this time uh, of, of our weekly meeting. And so, uh, Brother Austin, why don't you go ahead and pray for us as a blessing on the offering?
Amen. Janelle, um, at this time, uh, Brother Farnham, why don't you come and um, up the platform, and he's going to preach here in just a second. The girls are going to come, and uh, they're going to give us our special for the evening, and as soon as they are done, Brother Farnham, it's all yours. I see a green light. Does that mean go? All right. Good. 2 Corinthians tonight, chapter 8. 2 Corinthians chapter 8. We're going to look at a verse. 
and a message I've entitled, Sacrifices for Missions. Sacrifices for Missions. It's been a joy to be with the Bethel Baptist Church. It's been a blessing to meet the Walses. And I met Brother Walls's uncle a number of years ago at our church in LaGrange, Indiana. And uh, he is in Taiwan already. And so they have a connect over there. And they are looking forward to finishing deputation. They're at, I think you said 53%. All right. They're halfway there. So that's, uh, that's a request that I'm sure they wouldn't mind your shouldering with them. That uh, they would uh, get that done and get on the field as soon as possible. Good to meet the Sprungers again. I can remember Brother Sprunger from many years ago. Good to meet the Schmitz. They're helping us. But it's a blessing to be here. And again, uh, thank you, Brother Decker, for inviting us on the fly, sight unseen and all that. You know, this this is kind of an interesting little... You have a sister uh, in, uh, in Mooresville, Indiana, correct? Yeah, yeah. And I was just there about a month ago and preached on the subject of prayer. And after the service, uh, your brother-in-law came up. He said, I'm going to tell my dad about you, or my father-in-law about you. And then the father-in-law got in touch with Brother Decker and said, well, if you need a speaker, uh, this guy might be available. So kind of around, that's why I told you last night, I'm the substitute. So I'm not sure who I'm substituting for, but here we are. And it's been a blessing to be in Alabama for a few days. And uh, we, we got wet today, but that's okay. I've never had to shovel rain. All right. Let us look at one verse here in 2 Corinthians chapter 8, and it's the ninth verse. For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. I think it would be good for us tonight to look at that verse again and say it together, out loud. All right, let's say it together. Beginning, For you know the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, that though he was rich, yet for your sakes he became poor, that ye through his poverty might be rich. What a marvelous verse. What a glorious truth that is. And when you think of the Lord coming down from heaven, when you think of that uh, conversation that is recorded in the 10th chapter of Hebrews where Jesus said to his father, I delight to do thy will, O God. A citation from the 40th Psalm. When you think how Jesus came into this world, the sacrifice that he made for our sakes, though he was rich, though he had all the riches of heaven, though he had at his disposal the angels, though he had at his disposal all the glories and the majesties and the beauties of heaven, though he had all of the Father's eye and heart, he left that, voluntarily laying aside not his deity, but some of the manifestations of it to bear our sins in his own body on the tree. I've heard it said many times, Jesus Christ, the greatest missionary the world has ever known. He left his home country, went to another country to bring people to heaven. So let's consider some sacrifices for missions and let's pray together tonight. Father, I want to thank you for your mercy to this crowd of people. The fact that in this room tonight are sinners saved by grace. In this room tonight are those who at some point in time, just like Brother Sprunger testified tonight, and just like Brother Walls testified last night, at some point in life, bowed the knee, bowed the heart, and put faith and trust in the shed blood of Jesus Christ. And now tonight would you minister the word of God to these dear people. And we commit this hour to thee in Christ's wonderful name we pray. Amen. Sacrifices for missions. When we think of the example that our Lord Jesus set for us of making that sacrifice, coming down from heaven to men, leaving his home country, leaving his, his father, leaving his, the, the one that was 
that was so dear and precious to him and, and, and going down to this earth as the precious and only begotten and much beloved son. You remember from heaven, the Lord said, this is my beloved son and how he must have, how he must have missed him, if I can put that in quotation marks. Because Jesus and his father had perfect communion and, and they are everywhere and, and the son of man, even though he was on earth, was also in heaven because he's omnipresent and yet there was a voluntary setting aside of that. And when we think of sacrifice, we, we all kind of want to grab onto things. We want to hold back. I would challenge you tonight to, to say what Jesus said. I would delight to do thy will. Father, if there is something you want me to do in prayer for missionaries, I will do that. If there is something you want me to do by proxy, that is, though I can't go, I can help send, then I will do that. If there is something you want me to do in person, then I will do that. Churches in the United States of America are accustomed to having these special people come on Wednesdays and Sundays. We call them missionaries. They come in, we shake their hands, we look at their prayer cards, and we go back to our normal lives. They're making those sacrifices what sacrifices are we going to make? Let's talk about, number one, the sacrifice of prayer, sending supplication, the sacrifice of intercession. And I, I will call your attention to some verses tonight. And let's start with a verse in Romans chapter 15, a couple of verses there. Romans 15, verses 29 and 30. Notice what Paul says to the Roman church. He's never been to Rome yet. He's sending a letter on ahead, anticipating that he will come there one day as a missionary, anticipating this day. It had been a lifetime goal. And, and in fact, there was a time when God gave Paul a vision and he said, you're going to preach here. And after you've preached here, you will see Rome. And with that glorious goal in mind and that anticipation, notice what he says as this letter, this great letter of the book of Romans comes to an end. Romans 15, 29, And I am sure that when I come unto you, I shall come in the fullness of the blessing of the gospel of Christ. Now I beseech you, brethren, for the Lord Jesus Christ's sake, and for the love of the Spirit, now look at these words, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me, that I may be delivered from them that do not believe in Judea, and that my service which I have for Jerusalem may be accepted of the saints, that I may come unto you with joy by the will of God, and may with you be refreshed. Did you notice that phrase, that you strive together with me in your prayers to God for me? It sounds like prayer can sometimes get to be work. I wonder tonight at Bethel Baptist Church, if there would be a couple, then you would say, you know, I don't have a lot of money, I don't have a lot of health left, but I can sure pray. I was talking to a preacher friend of mine not long ago. His dad is way up in his 90s. He pastored the same church for over 60 years. And he said, Dad can't get up and walk around much anymore. He spends most of his day either in a chair or in bed. But he said, my dad prays for six hours a day. 92, three years of age. Just just gets in his chair because he can't get up and move around much and just cries out to God. And I will tell you, if you listen to anything tonight that Brother Sprunger pray, uh, talked about, if you listen to anything that Brother Wall said last night, if you listen to your missionaries, you're going to find out that what I said last night is true. Missions is impossible without the power of God. The Great Commission is an impossibility. There is no way in the world that we can reach the world except 
by the power of God. And how do we call that down here? How do we get the power of God? Listen, we get it by striving together in prayer. We get it by begging and pleading with God. It's not these little flippant, shallow prayers. They don't get anything done. And we Americans, I'm sorry, we're used to pushing buttons and getting things done. We need to quit Googling everything and start getting a hold of God again. I'm not against your computer. Your computer is not the devil. The devil can use your computer, but your computer it has no spiritual value. And your cell phone and all the rest of your little gadgets and gimmicks, and I have some of them. I don't know what to do with them, but I have some. I just carry a phone around just so I look modern. About the only modern looking thing about me. But we need to get back to some real praying. And that's where the power comes from. Paul said that you strive together with me the sacrifice of prayer, sending up our supplications where we really take time out of our day, where we get off from Facebook and YouTube and Twitter and all this. You probably heard that YouTube and Twitter and Facebook are all going to go together. Have you heard that one? It's going to be called You Twit Face. Just get off of that stuff for a while. Go in a room, shut the door, get on your knees with some prayer cards in front of you and beg God to do something. Because those missionaries, this man, Brother Walls, and his wife, this man, Brother Sprunger, and his wife, they're just people. They don't have pixie dust in their pockets. And even if they did, pixie dust doesn't save souls. We need the power of God, and we're going to get it when we pray for these missionaries. I would call your attention to the book of Ephesians, chapter 6 tonight. The book of Ephesians, Paul makes it very personal. He has given us in the sixth chapter of Ephesians this great, uh, this great focus on the armor of God. And there's a belt of truth, there's a shield of faith, there's a breastplate of righteousness, there is the shoes of the, of the preparation of the gospel, there's a helmet of salvation. And then he says this at the end, he says in verse 17, take the helmet of salvation and the sword of the Spirit, which is the Word of God. Now notice, praying during your missions conference. Is that what he says? No, he says always. Praying always with all prayer and supplication in the Spirit and watching thereunto with all perseverance and supplication for all saints. And then he makes it personal. He says, and for me. Well, who's Paul? He's the missionary. Paul was the one out there starting churches, going from city to city, following the Macedonian vision, following the call of God, getting stoned, getting shipwrecked, getting scourged, getting thrown in prison. This was the man that was saying, hey, and, and would you pray for me? And for me, and he said, and here's what I want you to pray for. Pray that I don't have any more trouble. Pray that I just, you know, I'm just tired of being persecuted. Is that what he said? No, he said, pray for me that utterance may be given unto me that I may open my mouth boldly to make known the mystery of the gospel for which I am an ambassador in bonds that therein I may speak boldly as I ought to speak. How do missionaries have the power and the boldness to open their mouths in an unfriendly culture? with unfriendly government officials, with people pointing AK-47s at them? How do missionaries have the boldness to go into a situation where it's not a free country? Where do they get the ability to do that? They get it from people praying for them begging and pleading with God for them. I would call your attention to these and other passages, but even, even Hebrews 13, where, where Paul says, pray for us. It just makes a statement, pray for us. 
I would encourage you tonight as you sit here in these beautiful uh, surroundings in your soft padded pew, I would, I would encourage you as you're going to go home tonight, you have an easy chair and a soft bed and you have a nice vehicle and a, and a warm house and plenty of food, I would encourage you to say that starting with this missions conference and until God calls you home, your house is going to be a place for the sacrifice of intercession on behalf of these people that are doing a work you and I can't do. But you need to understand they can't do it without you. I've never known a missionary who doesn't say something like this. Thank you for your financial support, but thank you even more for your prayer support. So there is this matter of the sacrifice of, supp of intercession where we send our supplications up to God. But then there is the proxy sacrifice where we send not just the supplication, but we send someone else. And this church has the has the ability, I, I don't know, 25 or 30 missionaries along this wall and that wall would take another few and a few more and a few more and, and you know what, you'll have them all up here in the choir loft and you know, you'll have to move the chairs or, or stick, stick a letter on the back of each chair or something, have some hanging on the front of the pulpit. Nobody's heart's going to be broken, amen. That'd be good, wouldn't it? And by the way, wouldn't it be good to fill up these pews? Yeah, that'd be a good thing too, wouldn't it? It'd be nice to have chairs sitting out that we actually needed to use. Be nice to get to the point where the choir has to stay on the platform. And you know how that happens. You know what the lifeline of the church is? Missionaries. And the more you get involved as a church, the more your vision is turned. We sang the song tonight. You stole my invitation. I had to change my invitation song. Set my soul afire for the lost in sin. That's not just on the mission field, that's right here. And the lifeline of Bethel Baptist Church is a heart for missions, and when this church takes care of God's workers and God's men, God will take care of this church. Nothing grows a church any more than a vibrant missions program. Nothing grows a church any more than a vibrant missions program. And if you are going to make the sacrifice of prayer, may God bless you, but the sacrifice of sending other people, the sacrifice of investment in Philippians chapter 4, I referenced this last night. I would call your attention to that passage tonight. Paul had been in Philippi, at, at different times in his ministry, we find the, the record of that in Philippians, or in the book of Acts chapter 16. That's where they met uh, the, the girls uh, possessed by a spirit of divination. Paul was thrown in prison. They met Lydia there. They started a church there. It was one of those cities where, where the believers were just extra special and Paul just loved them. He called them his dearly beloved and longed for his joy and crown. He loved these people. There was something special about this church in Paul's heart. And you know what they did? They loved him back. They supported him. Now let's look at it. Philippians 4.10, But I rejoiced in the Lord greatly, that now at the last, your care of me hath flourished again, wherein you were also careful, but you lacked opportunity. Not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in whatsoever state I am therewith to be content. I know both how to be abased and I know how to, be, how to abound everywhere and in all things. I'm instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ which strengtheneth me. Notwithstanding, you have done well that you did communicate with my affliction. Now you Philippians know that in the beginning of the gospel, when I departed from Macedonia, no church communicated with me as concerning giving and receiving, but ye only. For even in Thessalonica, you sent once and again unto my necessity, not because I desire a gift, but I desire fruit that may abound to your account. But I have all. 
and abound. I am full, having received of Epaphroditus the things which were sent from you, an odor of a sweet smell, a sacrifice acceptable, well-pleasing to God, but my God shall supply all your need according to his riches in glory by Christ Jesus. Now unto God and our Father be glory forever and ever. Amen. Here was this church in Philippi. They joined with Paul in this ministry. They sent gifts to him. And Twice while he was in Thessalonica for just three Sabbath days, they sent something to him. Something came up. I don't know what it was that came up, but something happened to the Philippian church. Either they backed away from support or something happened where they couldn't. We don't know what happened. We just know that Paul says they were careful but lacked opportunity. But then the opportunity came again. And they started supporting him. And he tells them how precious that was to him. Can you imagine what it's like to drive around the countryside like missionaries do? Three, four, five, six children in the back seat. Mom's up front homeschooling four of them, nursing one of them, changing diapers. And, and the, the husband has got to go from this church to that church. And I'll tell you what, when they get out of the car, they all have to look just like this. Every hair has to be combed. The little girl's curls have to be nice and the bows straight. And the boys have to have their shoes all polished so you can shave in them. And they've got to have their ties on. And boy, their, their shirts can't have spaghetti stains on them from the fellowship dinner the night before. And they have to have a washer in the back seat of the car. And they travel all over the countryside for a year or two or three, raising support, and they get to the field, and they think, what happened to that church? They used to be supporting us. Well, there's 50 bucks a month we're not going to get. Oh, what happened to this church? Well, there's 100. And you know what? They have to come back home and raise more support. Can you imagine living like that? That's how missionaries live. You know, they have bills too. Their kids need dental visits, just like your kids did. Your kids get earaches like your kids get earaches. Maybe they get ingrown toenails. I don't know what they need, you know, but they have health issues. They need clothing, too. By the way, their kids grow. I mean, there are missionaries that we took on when we first went to LaGrange, Indiana, and they had one little kid. Now they have adults in their family, and I'm like, whoa, when did that happen? They have needs. They need vehicles and they need insurance and they have many needs that we don't have and we are sending them out and I will tell you that one of the greatest things you can do is get involved financially. I don't care if you put down on your card on Saturday $25 a week, $50 a week, $100 a week, whatever God puts on your heart. It is a promise between you and God and you're doing it by faith but I will tell you there are faithful, choice servants of Jesus Christ all over the world who need your help. Paul needed their help. Do these missionaries learn how to be abased and how to abound? Have you had times on the field, brother, when it was tight? Yeah. Have there been times when it was like, wow, it's going great. Of course. Yeah. These people, they haven't gotten there yet. But they're going to know what that's like. It's not all, you know, cheesecake and ice cream. There's, you know, there's some days you've got to eat dirt. You've got to eat a peck of dirt before you die anyway, so. Or is it a bushel? I can't remember. I think it depends on what part of the country you're from, how much dirt kids really eat, you know. Sending them and investing in them. I like what 3 John says. The Apostle John brings up something about missions. I don't ever hear this at missions conferences, but it's phenomenal. The book of 3 John, and it's only one chapter. So if you get to chapter 2, you went too far. Back up. You get to chapter 2 of 3 John, you're in the book of Jude. Third John chapter 1, verse 5. Beloved, thou doest faithfully whatsoever thou doest to the brethren and to strangers which have borne witness of thy charity before the church, whom if thou bring forward on their journey after a godly sort, thou shalt do well, because that for his name's sake they went forth 
taking nothing of the Gentiles, we therefore ought to receive such that we might be fellow helpers to the truth. Who were these traveling people? They were people taking the gospel from one place to another. And, and John is praising this church. He calls them the, the elder, the well-beloved Gaius. I believe that 2 John is written specifically to the church. 3 John, I believe, is written specifically to Gaius, the pastor of that church. And I believe that, that you, can, you can find that because of the similarity of the message. And by the way, the message to the pastor and the message to the church is pretty much the same message. And he says, you're doing faithfully the things you do for the brethren. And you bring them forward on their journey after a godly sort. What kind of a journey is a godly journey? It's a journey that is made for the spread of the gospel. It's a journey that is made for the spread of the truth. And they don't take things of the Gentiles. I don't think the Walses have a bank that is providing for them. I don't think they have some business back home that is underwriting their ministry uh, for $1,000 a month. No, you know what? Missionaries go out and they get their support from the people of God. This is God's work. Missions is the work of God in the world. And God's people support God's work. It's a wonderful thing. I believe that there are people in this room tonight who should be earnestly seeking God and can be earnestly seeking God to say, how can we get involved in this missions program? We haven't been involved in faith promise. We've given our tithe. That's kind of been all the thing that we've done. But you know what? We need, we need to start doing something for these missionaries. I don't want to get into all the money we spend on trifles in the United States of America. I, I just don't want to do that. But we do a lot of that in this country. You know, I could, there, there's so many things I could pick on. People treat their pets better than they treat the, the servants of Jesus Christ. Now, you may love your dog. I, I, I'm not asking you to go home and shoot your dog. But your dog doesn't need a $500 toy. But these missionaries do need $500. I'm not asking you to abuse your children. But I've been in Christians' homes where there had to be a toy room. There's so many toys. There's a whole room to fill up. Nobody needs that many toys. You know, I, I, I was in a man's house not too long ago. He opened a gun cabinet. I ran. <laughs> the guy had over 25 guns. Who needs 25 guns? I'm not against the Second Amendment. I'm pro NRA. I'm pro gun rights and all the rest of it. But who needs 25 guns? And he said, well, I use this one I'm sh when I'm shooting this kind of an animal. I use this one when I'm shooting that kind. And I use this one when I'm shooting. And he told me all the different animals that he used the different guns on. And I'm thinking, wow, I just go down to the market and get my beef. <laughs> you know, if you want to be a hunter, go, go for it. I'm not against hunting. I'm not against fishing. But who needs 47 fishing rods? You, you see where I'm going with this. Not against prosperity. I'm against prosperity that cuts out the work of God. You know, in the Bible, the book of Acts, we have a man named Barnabas. He had houses and lands, plural. The Bible doesn't say they sold all of what they had. It says those that had houses, plural, and lands, plural. You know, you can live in only one house at a time. You know what they did with those extras? They sold them. They brought the money 
who knows how much it was. I don't know the economy of Rome. I'm not a, an expert on ancient currencies. But they brought the money. They laid it at the apostles' feet. They turned around and walked away. They said, give it where it's needed. I don't know. Maybe somebody has something like that here. I'm not against your having something for your retirement. I have a house back in LaGrange. It's not a fancy house. You know what? It keeps the rain off in the summer and it keeps the snow off in the winter and we have a little lawn and we have a little shed out back and I have a mower that I bought for a, a few hundred bucks. My neighbor to the north and my neighbor to the south, they have better homes and gardens yards. When they drive by my house, they go like this. I keep the grass mowed. Period. What I'm trying to say is, can we simplify a little bit so we can get some people to the mission field? Can we downsize? Is there something that we can invest in God's work to the uttermost part? I want to say thirdly tonight, not just the sacrifice of sending up our supplications in prayer, not just the sacrifice of sending somebody else in this, in this, in this matter of getting, getting the gospel to the ends of the earth, but what about the sacrifice of person? What about going yourself? What about that? Have you ever thought that for your two-week vacation you'd go to a mission field and just help somebody for two weeks? Have you ever thought about that? Have you ever thought that when, when, when semi-retirement comes around that instead of buying a motorhome and traveling all over the country to do everything you want to do, you would take some of that time Talk to somebody in a mission agency and say, who needs some help? Is there a couple that's struggling and they could use a, a grandpa and a granny to come along and just, just play with the kids a little and give the mom and dad a little? Is there somebody that needs something that I could do? Maybe there's somebody sitting here tonight and God's tapping you on the shoulder. And he's not just tapping you on the shoulder. He's squeezing your heart a little bit. He's saying, I want you to be a missionary. The, the sacrifice of person. I remember this. I, I have thought of this so many times. I remember of a preacher preaching in a back country church. The offerings they brought to the preacher were things like chickens and cucumbers. Just an old country church back in a holler somewhere. Yeah, I can say holler. Now up north, holler means you raise your voice. Down here it means a place back where there's just a two-track. The missionary didn't have any idea what he would get for an offering, but he preached his heart out in this little country church. And at the end of the service, a little boy crept out, crept past daddy and mommy. A little barefoot, ragged jean boy came down to the front. He grabbed one of the offering plates, and I won't do this because I'll break it. He took the offering plate, put it right on the floor, and stepped inside. He said, I'm going to give myself. The missionary said it was the biggest offering they received on his whole furlough. Because he gave himself. And that's what we find in the book of 2 Corinthians. We were just there a few moments ago. And if you want to go back there, 2 Corinthians chapter 8, where we started tonight. And we won't be much longer. In 2 Corinthians chapter 8, look at verse 5. And this they did not as we hoped, but first gave their own selves to the Lord and unto us by the will of God. Romans 12, 1 and 2 talks about this. To give yourself a living sacrifice. You know, God doesn't want you necessarily to die for him. He wants you before you die for him to live for him. 
to present your body. He says, present your body. You know why he says that? You know why Romans focuses on that? Romans chapter 6 says, yield yourselves unto God as those that are alive from the dead and your members as instruments of righteousness unto God, Romans 6, 13. Then we get to chapter 12, and he says, present your bodies a living sacrifice, holy, acceptable unto God, which is your reasonable service. What is this presentation? What are these members? The members of the body that are mentioned in Scripture are the hands, the feet, the eyes and ears, the tongue or lips, the mouth, even the mind and the heart, the nose. What is the significance here, folks? The significance is we yield them either to God or to the world. I would like to ask you tonight, what sin can you commit without using at least one of those members? You can't commit a sin if you don't employ your hands or your feet or your eyes or ears. Something You have to employ something. Those same members are to be yielded unto God as those that are alive from the dead. We're alive from the dead. We've been saved by the power of God. Last night, the missionary told about when he got saved. Tonight, the missionary told about when he got saved. How about I do that? I got saved as a senior in high school. I'd been testified to by an underclassman for the year before. I had never been to church, never heard the gospel, didn't have any idea God loved me. When she started talking to me about John 3.16, I didn't know what John was. I didn't know what 3 meant. I didn't know what the 16 was. I'd never seen an organ, didn't know what an organ looked like, never opened a Bible. But she started telling me I needed Jesus. When she said that to me the first time, I looked right at her. I said, I thought you were more intelligent than that. Because I was a highfalutin, arrogant atheist. I'll tell you what. She just kept at it. and Kept at it. She was a bus kid from, are you ready for this? Louisiana. Can any good thing come out of Louisiana? Yeah. Her dad was in the Air Force. He got stationed up north where I grew up on a farm in northern Vermont. And that girl came to our school and she focused in on me. I believe the Lord sent her to our school to reach this farm boy. Because to my knowledge, other than my brother and me, she never led anybody else to Jesus Christ. And she's made an absolute mess of her life by terrible decisions. But I thank God she began opening her mouth to me. I put my faith and trust in Jesus Christ on the 25th of October, 1974. I woke up the next morning to milk cows, and the first conscious thought in my mind was, Jeff Farnham, you are under new management. It was a Saturday morning. At breakfast that morning after milking the cows, I said to Dad and Mom and my two brothers, I'm going to church tomorrow. My mother wheeled around like I just cussed her mother. She said, you're doing what? I said, I'm going to church tomorrow. And that began a battle in our family. It wasn't a welcome news moment. My dad on Sunday mornings would think up chores that I'd never heard of on the farm just so we couldn't go to church. Because when I started going, my older brother started going. But you know what? God's a powerful God. And I got to church more often than not. And I got, kept going and kept going. And then my Jewish grandmother gave me the, birth, uh, the graduation present of going to California where she lived. And I went out there and joined a Baptist church. And the pastor of it was a man named Shelton Smith. Now editor of the Sword of the Lord. And after being under that preaching for a while, I knew that God wanted me to be a preacher. Went forth on a Sunday night. 4th of April, 1976. I had been counseling with him about some matters, and he had encouraged me to pray that God would show me what he wanted me to do with my life. And I shook his hand that night. I said, Pastor Smith, the Lord wants me to be a preacher. You know what he said to me? 
He said, I knew that. I just wanted you to know it. I wonder tonight, is there somebody here and you know God wants you to personally do something related to missions? Then surrender to that. Give, give your heart to it. Submit to it. 2 Corinthians 8. They first gave themselves. You'll never give anything else if you don't give yourself. I'd like us to stand with our heads bowed and our eyes closed tonight. And as we think of the sacrifice that Jesus Christ made, a living, willing sacrifice, when he came down from heaven's glory, though he was rich, for your sake he became poor. And perhaps tonight there is a man, a woman, a couple, and a teenager, an individual, somebody, and you would say, I need to respond. Our pianist is coming. If you would just start playing softly, number 296. We have a story to tell to the nations. While that piano is playing softly, I want to extend an invitation. You may not be accustomed to coming to the front. I think there is value in that. But do business with God tonight. Maybe this is a time for you to covenant with God that you're going to be a diligent prayer warrior for the missions program of this church. Maybe tonight is the night you're going to just settle your giving to missions. Maybe tonight. say tonight's the night I'm just going to settle it I'm going to go and actually get involved and do something in God's work we have a couple praying here at the front will there be any others Let's open our song books and sing a couple stanzas of this great song. 296. Sing it right out with victory in your voice. We've a story to tell to the nations that shall turn their hearts to the right. A story of truth and mercy, a story of truth and light, a story of peace and light, and the darkness shall turn to the dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright. And Christ's great kingdom shall come to earth, the kingdom of love and light. On the third, we've a message to give to the nations that the Lord who reigneth above hath sent us his Son to save us and show God is lost, sing it out, and the darkness shall turn to dawning, and the dawning to noonday bright, and Christ's great kingdom shall come to earth, the kingdom of love 
and light. We've a Savior to show to the nations who the path of sorrow hath trod that all of the world's great peoples to the truth of God might come to the truth of God and the darkness shall turn to the dawn and the dawning to noonday bright and Christ's great kingdom shall come to earth a kingdom of love and light Amen Well Hope you heard tonight what the Lord wanted you to hear. Let it sink in. Chew on it for a while. Don't spit it out until you get all the goodness. And every now and then, uh, do like a cow. You know what cows do, right? They have, uh, what is it, four stomachs? They swallow it. Then they get hungry again. They think, hmm, that tasted good before. Hmm? Start chewing it again. They swallow it. Later on, they think about it again. Mmm. I wonder if there's anything left out of, out of that, that good meal. Mm. There it comes again. They chew it up and they swallow it again. What are they doing? They're trying to get all the nutrition, get every drop of what they can out of that meal. So what you receive so far in the missions conference, don't just take it for that night and say, okay, on to the next thing. No, no, no. Let the remembrance of things come back. That's the, that word, meditate. It's to bring back to memory. Chew on it a little bit more. and Let God continue the truth that we've heard in our hearts. And it's been good so far. Looking forward to the remainder of the week as well. Do pray for the Walls family as uh, they head out tomorrow. And it's been a pleasure absolute pleasure to have y'all with us and we pray that God will give you safety as well as a very quick um, finishing of the raising of your support you're leaving out in October right so heading out they're they're already playing they're going October 30th they're taking off and um, and getting to the field so pray the Lord will will bring in the remainder of what they need in the short period of time it'll be here before you know it and uh, they'll be heading out and so they'll blink twice and it'll be time but uh, pray the Lord gives them exactly the right meetings, the right places that they can raise that support and be going fully funded, ready to do the work that God has sent for them to do. And at uh, this time, let me ask uh, Brother, Brother Farnham and, uh, and the Sprungers and also uh, the Walls family, why don't you all go to the foyer for us and uh, they'll be back there. Please uh, drop by. If you get, haven't got a prayer card yet, get one from each one of them. That way you can pray for them. And uh, just spend a little bit of time. I know it's a little bit later, but if you want to spend just a few seconds talking to them, especially the Walls family, let them know you'll be praying for them. And, uh, and then we'll look forward to the next time we, we come back together. So let's go ahead, and we're going to pray. We're going to be dismissed uh, for this evening. Brother Butch up there in the crow's nest, uh, if you don't mind, why don't you dismiss us in prayer? <laughs>